My pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, just to introduce another one of our technology partners uh, in this uh, uh, day-long event, but actually like Verizon, a partner who's been with us uh, for many years now. Uh, David Stevens uh, is one of uh, the chief uh, strategy advisors to Worldwide Technologies uh, in the public sector space. Uh, he's been a hugely important advocate of the work uh, that we are doing here uh, at ASU in Arizona, uh, trying to create models uh, that he and his team can take across the country and around the world. Uh, he's been a, a huge champion of important work like uh, activities that we worked on together along with other companies like Intel and Dell uh, to bring Afghani uh, uh, women scholars uh, to ASU uh, so it's not only selling technology that I think makes uh, Dave Stevens such a terrific partner, but also his commitment to the humanitarian goals of education. Uh, and he is actually going to introduce uh, our colleague, uh, Aaron uh, Carr Jordan, who is going to facilitate uh, the panel uh, going forward. David, over to you. Oh, Lev, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so powerful to hear Dr. Crow and, and really Tammy's world set this up. I appreciate ASU's leadership in this and, and really bringing this together. Uh, it's so exciting. Um, you know, you've heard worldwide our, our desire as well is to make a new world happen. And so just to be a part of this group and all these great individuals is a pleasure today. Um, it's my honor today as we kick off this panel to um, introduce Dr. Erin Carr Jordan. Uh, she'll be moderating our panel of change makers in Arizona and around the globe who are working to expand access to high-speed broadband for underserved communities. Dr. Aaron Carr Jordan is the head of social impact for Ed Plus at ASU and is the head and co-PI of ASU's NSF funded advanced program. She has spent nearly two decades focused on equity and equality efforts and has held roles including faculty, department chair, national director, associate dean and CEO. She is a member of the UN Women, a UN Global Compact Signatory, and a Flynn Brown Civic Leadership Fellow. Uh, Dr. Carr, my pleasure. Hi, David. It is so nice to see you today, and what an incredible kickoff to this day-long event, uh, talking about smart regions and digging in a little bit to digital equity. Uh, I am thrilled to be moderating this panel uh, of incredible humans who are doing this work uh, locally, nationally, and around the world. Uh, I think Lev just, uh, and Lev and Tammy and uh, Dr. Crow just spoke uh, eloquently about the value and the necessity of having deep collaboration and coalitions as we hope to address some of these wicked challenges. David, I know that you and WWT are doing some of this work. Uh, would you mind just sharing briefly uh, a recent effort that, that you and a coalition engaged in? Yeah, I think Aaron, I would just maybe highlight a bit what Lev had mentioned briefly, uh, frankly, with ASU's leadership and, and Lev's passion to push this forward. We had a beautiful opportunity to work with Intel um, you'll probably hear more about their N50 effort. Uh, you heard a little bit about the opening up. And so worldwide's a, a, um, a part of the N50 effort and, and we teamed up with them and the Welcome to America project and Dell and others um, to really figure out a few things. One, um, the easy part, how can we bring devices to a number of refugees in the community? Um, that, that, that's the simple part, but, but more importantly, uh, how do we have the adoption and the literacy? And again, this is where ASU very much so stepped up in a significant way uh, to help on that literacy side of the house. And the goal is to look at this over time to uh, really have sort of a longitudinal study, if you will, with, with Intel and worldwide and others to say, when we provide the technology, when we provide the ecosystem, the adoption and the literacy, um, how does that change lives for the better over time? And we're confident, Will. We heard Dr. Crow talk about it. We have to get after this. We have to provide the means for all of our communities to be a part of this digital age uh, to make it ubiquitous, as we heard. So this was a very small microcosm of that. But I think the findings and the efforts uh, are going to really help power us forward. And really, you heard this in my mind, at the end of the day, it's about the coalition. It's about a number of partners coming together, public and private, to tackle huge systemic issues because uh, together we're better. 
Uh, so I would really highlight that. I know our panel has uh, amazing uh, talents apart from this, but uh, I think here locally, that's a, that's a really exciting project that we're starting to walk, watch unfold. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you sharing that. It's a great way to kick off uh, our dialogue where I hope we will have the opportunity to touch on some of these coalitions and best practices that are happening uh, in the work of our esteemed panel. Uh, I have the great privilege of introducing uh, the people who will be joining me today. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of, of each of them, Angela Seifer. Angela is the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Angela has been working in the field that we now call digital inclusion since 1997. She's physically set up computer labs in underserved communities and managed local digital inclusion programs. She's consulted for the US Department of Congress, excuse me, Commerce, and testified before Congress. She develops national strategies and solutions and really does this work from the ground up. She helped to found NDIA, which has become the unified voice for home and broadband access, helping people to get personal devices and helping set up technology training and support programs around the country. She serves on the board of directors for Schools, Health and Libraries Broadband Coalition. Government Technology Magazine named her as one of their top 25 doers, dreamers, and drivers, and she recently received the Parker Award. I am so happy that Angela is here today. She is really uh, a national treasure and is one of the groundbreaking people who is doing this work. Nicole Umayam is the Digital Inclusion Library Consultant at the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records. An archivist turned library consultant, Nicole supports libraries on projects such as improving library technology and broadband networks, Wi-Fi and hotspot and laptop lending, digital literacy and online learning, and digital preservation of culture and language. She collaborates around the country to increase broadband adoption and is focused here in Arizona on increasing broadband adoption and use. In 2020, she was honored with the Outreach Service Award from the Arizona Library Association and Association and in 2021, her work with the State Library was honored as a champion of education by School Connect. Amrita Chowdhury is the director of CCAOI and is a member of the UN Internet Governance Forum Multi Stakeholder Advisory Group. She is a vice chair of the Asia Pacific Regional at Large Organization and co vice chair of the Asia Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum. And Rita has over two decades of hands-on experience across various nuances of business and industry, including establishing and managing an association that represents the interests of the ecosystem of the internet. Philip Thigo is a technology, data, and policy expert. He's the senior director for Africa for the Thunderbird School of Global Management, a technical advisor at the Presidency on Data and Open Government, and senior consultant for UNDP Regional Bureau of Africa. He was recognized by Apolitical as one of the world's 100 most influential people in digital government. He's currently a member of the World Economic Forum Regional Action Group for Africa, is an advisory board member for the WEF Global Shapers Nairobi Hub, and is the chair of the board of an award-winning digital platform based in Kenya that uses technology to make children and their issues visible. And finally, we have one of our incredible students here from Arizona State University. Wendy Ruiz is a Barrett Honors College student and a college peer advisor at the Design Studio for Community Solutions in the Watts College of Public Service. Uh, as you can see, uh, and as you heard, we have uh, a tremendous opportunity today to dig in deeper to digital equity, to digital inclusion, and uh, to ask what best practices exist as we talk about uh, connecting the under and unconnected. Uh, I hope to dig in to what it really means to start to address some of these wicked challenges and how we can really work collaboratively to do so. As everyone thus far has alluded, uh, it is really when we work collectively and establish these coalitions that we can accelerate the pace to solution and that we can increase our impact and make sure that we, we are really serving those who need it most. So it is my privilege to uh, invite Angela to join me now uh, so that we can begin this conversation with really the woman who has been at the front lines for a very long time uh, and her insights will probably help us to, uh, to find our path uh, moving into the future. Angela, it is so nice to have you here today. Thank you, Erin. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Lev for inviting me. I always love to participate in your events. Uh, I have been doing this work a really long time. When people list those bios, you're like, oh, God, I'm old. <laughs> um, but I think that just tells us 
when the pandemic hit and all this attention was on digital inequities, they're not, they're not new inequities, right? We've always had the digital, multiple digital divides. Uh, we've always had folks on the ground trying to solve these digital divides, but we didn't have the attention on it and resources. And that's really what COVID has changed is that it's more than just a few folks trying to figure this out at the local level. There's federal resources now. Like it's a little mind blowing really that there's so much attention and, and so much um, positive action towards solving the issue. When we formed NDIA about seven years ago, we created definitions for digital inclusion and digital equity because the terms weren't being used in a way that was very helpful, including myself, we were just using them interchangeably. So our community, who's made up of folks on the ground, teaching digital literacy, helping folks get access to devices, helping folks sign up for a discount or now subsidized broadband offers from internet service providers, um, that this is the group that created those definitions. So digital equity is the goal. This is where we want to get individuals, communities, full access to information, communication, technology to do whatever it is they need to do. And we all know that that's pretty much everything in life these days. And then digital inclusion is the how. These are the activities. These are the, should we refurbish computers? Should we buy new computers? We should get them into homes, that's for sure, because going into a library is not really all that functional. Uh, who's teaching digital literacy? Oh, okay, which languages does that need to be in? And what exactly should be involved in teaching that? And what's most convenient for the, for the learners? Um, who's helping folks sign up for that affordable connectivity program? Because that's amazing that the federal government is now offering. It was 50, now we're down to 30, but it's still valuable. $30 a month toward an internet service. Who's helping folks sign up for that? Because it's the federal government. You know, it's not going to be easy. <laughs> so those are, those are the digital inclusion activities. These are the things that are going to get us to digital equity. And we need everyone working on all these issues. This is not a library problem. It's not a university problem, right? It's everyone. And this is that importance of you all talking about coalitions is that we do need everyone at the table figuring out how we're going to do it together, right? Um, it's, uh, it can be misleading sometimes if we think, oh, libraries, libraries always have this. It's the school's problem, whether it's K-12 or a university, but really it's everyone. And I think one way to think about that is who benefits? Who benefits from having everybody online? Banks healthcare, government, education, right? It basically retail, it's, it's really, it's our whole society. So that's why it's important to get everyone at the table. It's also important that this is not just a rural availability problem. Sometimes that can be um, easily misunderstood because we do have a serious availability problem in rural areas, but it's also an affordability problem. Internet in the US is expensive. So we need to make sure that we are addressing that affordability and do folks have the digital skills that they need? Often not. Why? Because technology keeps changing and how we use technology keeps changing. So urban, rural, suburban, tribal, it's really everywhere that folks live. And the more that we're clear about that, we can keep resources from only going into one place when they really need to go everywhere. And those coalitions are super important because they're gonna figure out what are the assets that we already have, who's already doing any of this digital inclusion work, um, and then how can we make sure that they can scale now that there's more resources than there was before? And are the folks that are doing the work trusted by their communities? Whoever's trusted, they should be put at the front of the line for those resources because trust is something you really can't buy, right? It has to just be something folks know that they figure out. And then, so in the organization that's trusted by the less connected members of our communities are the organizations that would be really best to be doing the digital inclusion work. That federal money, it's a little mind blowing and it's certainly confusing. So uh, I welcome everyone who's trying to figure out that digital equity aspect to use the resources on NDIA's website. We have, we have lots of them and we really do our best to interpret what the feds are saying, put it in the language that folks on the ground can use and figure out which buckets of money are the ones that they should be trying to go after. That was incredibly helpful. I think you uh, you mentioned the work of NDIA and what you release often to the community. And I think the community who comes together to have these conversations is growing daily in part, uh, obviously because some of the money uh, that is now uh, available uh, and the interest of people to really get involved in this work. 
for those who are new and who might need some of that translation that you just mentioned, would you mind just quickly level setting what we're talking about when we say digital equity versus digital inclusion? And then following that, are there any best practices of groups or exemplars uh, who are doing this work either from a policy perspective, a practice perspective, or from a coalition building perspective that, that you would like to highlight so that people can learn from that? Absolutely. Uh, so digital equity is the goal. We want everyone to get there, right? Individuals, communities having full access to information communication technology. Digital inclusion is the how. These are the pro, this is the programming that gets us to the digital equity. Um, it's going to take us a long time, right? So nobody should be like, okay, let's set a goal. We're just going to solve the digital divide and it'll be done next year for two years. That is totally not logical and folks should really not say that. <laughs> technology is going to keep changing. So we're gonna to need to keep adjusting our efforts because technology is going to keep changing and how we use technology is going to keep changing. That federal money that's out there, uh, there's lots of resources on our website to help folks understand what it is. There's money now from previous, um, uh, previous um, investments by the federal government, um, those are going through local and state governments. And then there's the Infrastructure Act that's gonna really focus on the broadband and the digital equity. Uh, so on our website are recordings of webinars and descriptions of what that money is. So folks can figure out how best they should look at it. And of course, remembering going back to those coalitions because that those are the folks that we really wanna lift up. Uh, I'm in central Ohio, uh, and prior to the pandemic, there was nothing happening here around digital equity. Like, I would go talk about the folks. I would talk about Nicole, right, <laughs> who's on this panel, and be like, oh, we should look at what Nicole's doing in Arizona. I wasn't saying anything about what's happening in my own town. I do now, right? And it's in the pandemic has drawn attention to that. There's an amazing coalition that's working well together, and they're figuring out what they need to do together right, and what those gaps are, and then they're going out and training other community-based organizations and other social service agencies that are interacting with less connected to make sure that those individuals and those entities have access to what is the affordable connectivity program? How do you use it? How do you help people sign up for it? It's those that type of understanding is something where if we're not talking about it and figuring it out together, the resources go underutilized. Absolutely. I think you hit on something uh, really quite important. Well, everything that you're hitting on is quite important. Um, but some of those barriers, and we know, you know, history repeats itself. And for those people who have been doing this work for decades now, there are lessons learned uh, aplenty. Uh, so can you think of any lessons that you've learned uh, along the way that you're seeing potentially repeat as barriers that we still need to potentially overcome that when we're working in these coalitions, we might have a better shot at it this time around. I think the lesson um, that we keep learning is that we need to meet folks where they are. So we can form, we can create this really amazing project. And we're like, okay, we're gonna do some digital literacy training and we're gonna distribute devices and we have all these pieces and we're gonna do it at this one building at four o'clock on Tuesday. <laughs> but then nobody turns out to be available at four o'clock on Tuesday. <laughs> Right. And then you're like, how come nobody came? <laughs> so that whole meeting folks where they are, like literally meeting them where they are. Are they already at the school picking up their kids at 3 15? Well, then that might be a good time to catch them. Right. So where are they so that you can provide those services? Because folks work when you are um, struggling financially, there's often multiple jobs. Right. Um, there could be health issues. You could be dealing with grandma and grandpa. Like there's just a lot going on. And so making sure that we recognize there's a lot going on and being in poverty is hard. Like nobody chooses that life, right? That's, it's, a, it's not a good place to be. So how can we make sure that we're helping them in a way that's most valuable to them? One of the models that developed during the pandemic that we're super excited about is the digital navigator model. It's the idea that there's an individual in a trusted institution who is helping folks with whatever their particular need is at that particular time around digital access. They can point folks to low cost and subsidized offers, help them sign up for that broadband service. They can point them to a subsidized computer. They can point them to which digital literacy trainings would make most sense for them, the right language, cultural usefulness, right? The time of day, or is it online? And they can help them with that immediate need. 
you need to figure out bus schedules like right now. Okay, let's figure out bus schedules right now because those bus schedules are online and you didn't have access and you're freaking out, right? So folks have those immediate needs. You help with the immediate need while figuring out that long-term solution. That's more of a one-on-one. -on -one. That's not a show up on Tuesday at four o'clock solution right? That's more of a meet people where they are and address their current need. And we're seeing that model just blossom and spread organically across the U.S. It's super exciting. We have lots of resources on our website where we're learning from folks on the ground and helping others to replicate the same model. That's fantastic. And, and your website uh, is uh, an absolutely fabulous uh, resource for anyone, whether you are novice to this uh, or you have been deeply engaged for a long time. So I strongly encourage anyone uh, who is doing digital equity or inclusion work to, to use it. It is there. Uh, one of my favorite aspects of the website is your uh, the blogs and the overviews of public policy that are provided. Uh, is there any public policy that you just briefly want to highlight that we should be paying attention to now that the, the political winds are shifting uh, and so much of what is happening is, is the driver of uh, decision making and, and what will really be impactful for our space in the near term? We will see a notice of funding opportunity coming out uh, in May for uh, what they're calling BEAD, uh, Broadband Equity Access and Deployment. Uh, somebody once said to me, if you take out the, uh, the equity piece of it, it's just bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's also a Digital Equity Act money in there also. So there's BEAD and then there's Digital Equity Act. Those are both in the Infrastructure Act. It's both going to come from NTIA. So that NOFO will be out in May. Definitely watch for that NOFO. For the equity, the Digital Equity Act piece of it, it's just going to be about the planning. So how do states do their planning? The way to prepare for everyone right now is be talking about this, right? This is why the coalitions are so important. Know who's doing any of this work locally. Know who's doing it at the state level. Be talking to folks at the state level. Those state broadband offices, God bless them, they've got to be overwhelmed, right? Be talking to the state broadband office. They should know what digital equity work you are doing right now. And then even before that, I'm told in some places, all the ARP money uh, has not been spent. Right. So be talking to local government, state government. Have they spent all of it? Is there any of it that hasn't allocated yet? Because the final rules from Treasury on that just came out a couple of weeks ago right. and it fully makes digital equity like absolutely it's eligible. So if you're doing work and your local or state government has any of that money still available, I would be asking them. Outstanding. And it's such a such an important point that you just made. When we talk about connecting the unconnected and underconnected, we don't just mean broadband. We, we need to make sure that they have the skills needed to fully engage, that, that they have the devices needed to do so, and that they have the supports once all that exists. Otherwise, they will not be able to fully participate. Angela, uh, it's, it's always such a pleasure to, to have the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you so much for, for being here today. Is there anything else that, that you'd like to share but before we let you go? Um, digitalinclusion.org is the website and uh, I'll hang out in the chat while my co-panelists are speaking. So um, if folks have questions, happy to interact. Thank you again so much, appreciate it. All right, uh, speaking of beginning at the grassroots level and community uh, to global, it is my great pleasure to bring up one of our students, Wendy Ruiz. Uh, Wendy, as I shared before, is a student in Watts College. She's a very honored student, uh, and she has been working uh, on a campaign in Maryvale. Uh, and I am, I am overjoyed that one of our students is here to talk today, and I can't wait to hear the perspective that you bring, which I think is just so, in, so unique uh, and is one of the most integral components of, of the work that we're all doing. So welcome. It's nice to have you. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Would you mind sharing just a little bit about the project that you've been working on and what it means to you and, and the role that, that you've been playing in it? Yeah, of course. So what we try to do is we want to give um, people in Maryville access to free internet. 
completely free, no cost, because the pandemic sh shun an issue that we do not have digital equity. And it is very important that everybody's on the same page. And from my experience, I remember growing up, I was also part, I was also part of Maryville, and I did not have internet growing up. I had to rely on the school, I had to rely on the library. And I, it wasted a lot of my time, honestly, because I would have to keep finding solutions and I wouldn't focus more on my work. So I thinking about that, I realized that we during the pandemic, it's even more difficult because now everything is online and you need Internet in order to succeed in school. So what we wanted to do was just kind of get the bill out of the way for them. We really wanted to help them because in my experience, I know it was hard. So imagine now that everything's transitioned online. And that time that we, that time that they have looking for solutions could be focused on their education and actually getting work done. And it wouldn't be a holdback. We want to take away as much barriers as they have um, for their education. We knock door to door and we try to really build that trust for them. That is very important, building, establishing that relationship, because without that trust, they won't be helped, like they, don't, they wouldn't want to be helped. And we did experience that when we had conversations um, with um, folks on Maryville, we knocked on their door and they would tell us like this is too good to be true free internet like there's no way that's like true and we try to just have that conversation be honest with them let them know that we are also part of the community we're like we're in the same community we grew up the same way like we want to establish that relationship and kind of having that conversation they were more open to it they kind of realized like okay like maybe you guys are trusting and you know we'll well, like they said, we'll meet them halfway. That's the most important part. Like you have to meet them halfway. Many of these people having these conversations want to be helped. They really do want to be helped, but they just have the lack of trust. So once you start building that connection by having these conversations and engaging within your community, then we can help them. We'll meet them halfway. We go to their doorstep. We set up a time, like, when are you available to do this? When are you available to have another conversation? And that's how we establish that relationship. That is absolutely phenomenal. And you touched on so many of the same themes that Angela was talking about that are happening in a, an, on a national scale, right? And, and bringing it home really to the community level. And I think, you know, we talk so often about the need to build trust uh, and to be uh, community responsive in, in all of the programs that we've designed. What lessons, if you don't mind sharing, have you learned from that door-to-door -door work and, and seeing the challenges associated with building deep, mutually respectful trust within the community. Um, and have you seen that lead to increased participation from the community members? Um, yes, so we every time we go canvassing and we have these conversations, there's many people wanting to learn more, wanting to know who we are, what we do. And I know there's also many of them that actually want to participate in the issues that are going on with their community. And what I learned is that they want to, but they don't know how. They have no idea. And I think as a, being part of ASU, we have the resources to meet them halfway. We have the resources to help them. So I think it's like our responsibility to go and tell them, oh, well, you can engage in this way or actually you can do this. Cause I had, I remember I had a conversation with the woman who told me that she wants, there's so many issues that she wants to address, but she doesn't know where to go to. She doesn't know who to tell. Or one time she told her school and like they didn't do anything about it. So many of these people also want to be part of the solution. And I think it's a great way when we have these conversations to lead them in that direction, lead them, you can go here or the resources are here, or we can also help you. So I think that's a big lesson that we learned. Many people want to be part of the solution. They just don't know where to go to. And I think I'm very happy and very glad that um, my team and I are able to provide that and help them and lead them in that direction. That's fantastic. What lessons have you learned uh, in doing this that you would help other people? You know, we're talking about people starting to do this work really at a grassroots level. Um, Maryvale is one community. We know there are many others with whom we want to work. 
clearly the skills that you're building and what you bring to this project um, is, is, is quite unique. Um, what lessons have you learned in doing the door knocking and in talking with the community and the perspective that you as a student um, working as part of a bigger project? Um, would you mind sharing some of those that we can potentially uh, learn from? Yeah, so a big one that I learned is that many of these people um, struggle financially. And I think just the fact that we need to address the financial issues that go on in low income communities is very important because they don't have the same access as high income communities. So I learned that we just need to address the root of the problem. We need to focus on that because without focusing the root of the problem and digging deeper, there's not going to be a solution. And it's very important to do so because there's like not many people in the Latino uh, Maryville community that go on to college. There's not many people that graduate. And we really, in order for them to um, prosper and the community, we really need them to have that education. So just focusing on the root of the problem is very important. And maintaining long-term relationships because we we have noticed that not many people like it when like we're like yeah we're gonna help and then like we just kind of like help them for like a week or so and then we move on like that's no we have to maintain these long-term relationships and get to the root of the problem so that's what I learned I learned that it is important to maintain the long-term relationship and I think we can really progress when we do that. I think that's just absolutely phenomenal. And I, you know, so many of us think about, you know, how to build trusting relationships and really being community responsive. And I think what you just shared, showing up and continuing to show up and to do so in a way that adds value to the community uh, is so key. Um, do you anticipate continuing to do this work? Yes, I will. We will continue to do this work. I love it. It brings a lot of joy, a lot of fulfillment. And I know. I wish I had somebody like that or a team to do that when I was younger. I needed it. So I want to be there for them. It's just my community, the same community. And it's just very fulfilling to see them progress. I love that. And it is it is generational, right? What you're doing now in the community hopefully will inspire other young people to, to join efforts and, and to continue to, to, help, to, to help other people as well. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share uh, while we have you here? Um, I think that's it. That's it. What you shared is, is inspirational. And I think we are tremendously lucky to have you on the team and doing the work that you're doing. I know the community appreciates it. I know that, that there is absolutely lessons to be learned from, from you and the efforts uh, of Watts. Uh, and, and certainly this is, this is a, a very important conversation because everything comes back to the individual level and the community level. Uh, and if we're do not doing it right in that space, then we can't do it right on larger scale. So thank you for the generosity of your time and for coming today to talk, about, uh, talk with us about the work you're doing. It was a pleasure meeting you. It was a pleasure meeting you too. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right, moving forward. Uh, we have now heard from Angela, who set the stage for the work that's happening uh, at the national level, uh, and one of our incredible students uh, who is here to talk about the work that's happening uh, at the community level. I have the great privilege now of inviting Nicole Umayam to, to join me talk, to talk about her work. Uh, her name was mentioned by Angela as one of the people who have uh, long been doing this work and doing it tremendous well, tr tremendously well. Uh, Nicole, I know that uh, working with the libraries and talking about libraries as uh, really essential anchor institutions uh, is at the heart of what you do. Uh, welcome today. It's great to see you again. I always love when you and I have the opportunity to talk. Uh, I'm hoping to talk to you a little bit about um, what, what public libraries uh, are doing in this moment related to digital equity and inclusion, uh, and why are libraries critical uh, as parts of smart regions? Thanks, Erin. It's always great to chat with you as well, and I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here with all these excellent students and leaders in this space. It's just really an exciting time. Um, but, you know, as we all know, and as, you know, Wendy just mentioned, libraries have really been critical to digital inclusion since before we even had a term for it, before the term existed. 
Um, they curate uh, and broker free access to information resources, to ebooks, e virtual programming, uh, online training, um, homework help, and even certifications. Um, and all of these digital services we've seen drastically increase during the pandemic, as well as you can imagine. Um, importantly, Arizonans are also relying on public libraries for the services that are critical to their very survival. And I'm not just talking about free public Wi-Fi and computers, but also libraries are serving as sites for food distributions for schools by partnering with um, those local entities. I'm thinking specifically of the Page Public Library and the Globe Public Library, who are really leaders in this space. Um, and recently, libraries are also becoming distributors of free COVID rapid tests. Uh, one leader is the Maricopa County Library District there. Um, in, uh, in 2020, New America released a survey that found that 15% of their respondents uh, lost their primary internet access when library buildings closed to the public. Um, the Prescott Valley Public Library even reported in 2019 that the Wi-Fi hotspots that they were checking out were the most circulated item of that entire year above all books, DVDs, um, and other, uh, other fun things that libraries lend. Um, we've also seen libraries all over increase the number of kits that include laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots to check out to people, um, increasing it so much so, so that this is now considered a core service that libraries provide, which wasn't necessarily the case before the pandemic. Um, libraries really acted quickly um, to keep their communities connected safely uh, by leaving the Wi-Fi on when the building was closed, by expanding the Wi-Fi hours that existed, by installing additional access points to actually extend that service out to the parking lots and sometimes a little bit beyond. Um, for example, the Coconino County Flagstaff City Public Library um, installed Wi-Fi boosters to expand the signal to all of their branches um, to make sure that people could connect. And a lot of libraries really acted quickly, even with quick changes, just as uh, moving, moving the routers a little bit closer to the window um, to meet those immediate needs. Um, other libraries, such as the Shello Public Library, actually deployed their bookmobiles to serve as mobile Wi-Fi uh, locations. Um, and then there's also the question of, well, how do you use public computers when the library building is closed to the, to the public? Um, well, librarians are pretty creative people. Um, and in Parker, which is in La Paz County, the library director actually started checking out laptops that they had in the library parking lot for two hour sessions. And they were so booked and the demand was so high that they had to apply for additional funding for more laptops and um, covered sheltered spaces for people to use while outside. Um, libraries in Southern Arizona also connected with the Arizona Telemedicine Program to deploy mobile labs to support telehealth services for people who had issues traveling uh, to see doctors during, um, you know, during this time. Um, but because libraries are really serving people from all walks of life um, and they're really prioritizing their local needs, um, they're always going to remain spaces where people are able to use new technology as well as just meet some of those critical needs of, of internet access itself. Um, they do this through um, introducing the communities to uh, maker spaces with things like 3D, 3D printers and tech petting zoos. And there's fun projects like introducing VR for seniors, um, as well as things like digitization labs to make sure that our community stories are preserved um, in, and shared with our, um, each other. Um, they also, of course, provide computer skills training and all, all sorts of digital content. Um, but as core values, libraries are also proponents of online privacy and the information literacy to make sure that people are safe and making informed decisions while they're online. And we can learn from library leadership as well um, in providing uh, assistive technologies um, for people with disabilities and special needs, such as large screen readers and downloadable braille and audio resources. Um, so, you know, libraries are really critical to smart regions, um, not only because of the role in the connectivity, but because of their greatest asset, which is actually the people in the libraries who are making this all happen. Um, they're trusted institutions with a really great reach and the staff are deeply knowledgeable about their communities and can offer a wide variety of resources. So it really makes them the ideal collaborators. And as um, President Crow highlighted, we're all relying on partnerships here. Um, library leaders are at the forefront of um, convening stakeholders and advancing state and local broadband and digital inclusion adoptions. Um, and to uh, work on uh, promoting literacy, workforce development, and community initiatives that are really reflecting these local needs. Um, I especially want to highlight the Yavapai County Education Technology Consortium, which is a countywide broadband initiative 
led by schools and libraries to uh, leverage uh, backhaul infrastructure to those anchor institutions and lead to connectivity at every home because of that backhaul. Um, there's also the Pima County Public Library, which is a leader in the county's strategic plan for digital access. So those library leaders are really the ones that you want to have collaborating with um, and advancing all of these initiatives. Um, so I think at this point, my bias is pretty clear that if you want to connect the underconnected, we need to support our public libraries. Um, like Angela said, you know, libraries are not the only answer, but they're a key part of our long-term solution. Absolutely. It, I mean, everything that you described is this uh, beautiful evolution of the role of the library in the, in the community. Uh, and you highlighted uh, the trust that is established between the library systems and the communities uh, that they serve. You mentioned community anchor institutions, uh, and I know you and I have talked about that before, but for those people who are joining us today who are less familiar with what an anchor institution is, would you mind sharing uh, just, a, just a brief overview of what a community anchor institution is and how the library systems are partnering with other community anchor institutions to accomplish some of these goals that you articulated? Mm -hmm. yep. So anchor institutions are the schools, libraries, health centers, food banks, uh, community centers, and local governments that keep our, keep our communities running and provide a lot of these critical needs. Um, they each have different roles, but as we've seen in the pandemic, they can't really serve their mission if the people they're trying to serve don't have internet access or don't have those skills to connect. So during the pandemic, we've seen you know, an interest in making sure that people are able to, to connect and uh, tap into these resources in ways that are um, actually going to, to support their needs. Um, one of the key challenges or barriers that um, the speakers today have highlighted is the idea of affordability of service. I think this is a really interesting place where we've seen um, some cool partnerships come out. Um, there have been food banks who have been collaborating with um, school districts and public libraries to sign up those individuals for discount internet service and actually to check out hotspots as they're receiving food packages. Um, there's a lot of um, really because uh, community anchor institutions are also able to leverage federal funding for some of that backhaul, um, they're also able to, um, sorry, let me just make sure I have my, my numbers right. Um, we know that they, they're able to form consortiums to work together to, to leverage this federal funding. So this year in the state of Arizona, $59.1 million in, in terms of broadband infrastructure deployment funding was requested from all libraries and schools. Um, and they're also using the state matching uh, funds from the governor's office and the corporation commission to make sure that this is deployed equitably throughout, um, throughout the state. You touched on so many different kinds of organizations that are working collaboratively with libraries. So it seems like it's all multi-sector, uh, multi-discipline, and it is through coalitions like that when we're looking at public policy, government involvement, civil society, anchor institutions that uh, when everyone comes together collectively, we can really start to identify the problems, address the challenges and move towards solutions which is phenomenal and, and clearly libraries, thank you so much for the, for the fantastic overview, have evolved in the role that they're playing in the community in a way that really does tie them deeply to smart regions. Uh, and I hadn't thought of libraries really serving in that capacity and, until you just described it. And I still have conversations with you. So uh, that was incredibly enlightening for me. Uh, you touched just briefly on some uh, public policy elements. I'm hoping that you can give a brief overview of the Affordable Connectivity Program uh, and, and what that means for the community uh, so people can really understand what's coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. So the Affordable Connectivity Program is a federal benefit program. It's a monthly discount of up to $30 for low-income individuals who qualify and uh, per month and up to $75 for individuals who are on rural tribal lands. Um, we know that rural tribal lands are disproportionately impacted by um, digital inequity as well. So it's a, it's a great intervention. Um, so it, it's a lot of times libraries are the information hubs for getting people information about, you know, well, what are the plans available when I can't come to the library? How do I connect at home? So we're really um, seeing a lot of libraries and other institutions partner to get information out to their communities. 
Um, our Connect Arizona initiative is a statewide program to provide um, this information that people need to get digitally connected, as well as to provide one-on-one -on -one support through our digital navigators, um, who are library staff that we've hired from all around the, the state who provide free tech assistance and digital navigation service to help people get connected. Um, through this initiative, we've really relied on our partners from the Arizona Broadband Stakeholders Network, from School Connect, and from Common Sense Media to widely inform as many other uh, community organizations, schools, churches, um, you know, local governments about this program and to provide resources for those people working at those organizations to sign up their community members. Um, of course, our digital navigators also support this program. So if you have folks who need help, uh, help getting set up, then give us a call. Um, but it's really been a, um, a, an instigator to, to get some coordination and really um, shed light on the fact that it's, it is about affordability. I can remember a few years ago when we'd say, hey, we, you know, we really need to make sure that people are able to pay for these services. It's great if um, right. that service is available, but if they can't afford it, it doesn't really do much. And unfortunately, um, only a few years ago, people just said, well, there's nothing we can do about affordability. We have to look elsewhere. We're seeing that, uh, that tone change now. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and, and that affordability piece uh, brings us right back home to how can we identify collaborators who are willing to sp step in and leverage their areas of expertise to collectively address some of these challenges. And, and we know that for uh, a very long time, affordability has, one of been, has been one of the key drivers to people being unable to connect. So thank you so much. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Is there anything, I invite you to share anything else that you'd like to prior, uh, prior to our bringing Amrita on? Yep, um, so our website is connect-arizona.com. You can get access to our uh, digital navigators that way, as well as um, public data on um, digital access at the county level that we've compiled to help uh, support local change makers as they're having these conversations and they're trying to drive the conversation about how to get all of us connected. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to join us and for all of the incredible information that you shared. This was incredibly helpful, uh, both for me and I'm, for, I'm sure for all of the people uh, who are listening who wanted to know more about anchor institutions and also uh, the brilliant work that continues to happen uh, out of library. So thank you so much. It is my pleasure now to invite um, Rita Chowdhury to join us. Uh, and Rita joins us uh, from New Delhi in India and uh, is, I'm, I'm very hopeful will help bring our community, local and national conversation uh, into a, a global lens. Uh, and Rita, your work uh, is uh, wide ranging, tremendous. You're involved in policy conversations, multi-stakeholder engagement uh, at a global scale and certainly have uh, been deeply engaged in internet ecosystems and how to work collectively to solve some of these uh, big uh, internet related connectivity problems. I'm hoping you can shed some light on um, some of the innovative, innovative grassroots efforts to connect the unconnected uh, and what you've seen really in your work that uh, you can highlight as best practice exemplars uh, and what you see uh, on the horizon. Thanks a lot, Erin. Uh, great to be here and thanks Leif, for having me. First of all, my perspective would be from a developing nation, so it might be slightly different. However, uh, when I look at people who are not connected, many of the issues are same in both developed and developing countries. Uh, having said that, I agree with Angela that the uh, COVID situation has actually uh, put back the focus of connecting people, not only of the regulators, but also of common citizens, because they have been pushed to such an extent that they have no other option but to go online uh, to get these services. Um, so there, you know, um, people have been pushed into it, even if they are 70 year old, 80 year old, even if they do not understand English, because I come from a country where more than 70% do not understand English. Uh, and unfortunately, most of the websites, most of the services are even now in English. Uh, you know, if I look at India, for example, because I come from there, I will take that example. Uh, we have the second largest internet user base However, we have more than 60% people yet to be connected. Uh, we have some of the least 
you know, the broadband rates are quite low, but we have an affordability challenge. Uh, we have mobile devices, which are quite, uh, you know, might be in the world, you don't have that cheap devices, but there are many people who cannot afford it. We have social inequities. For example, a phone or an internet may be given to a boy in the house first and not given to a girl first. Uh, there are those issues uh, which we have. So, you know, when we look at India, we have different kind of issues happening. However, people are aspirational. They want a better life. They want uh, you know, to leapfrog from where they are to a better life. So those are certain dichotomies we have. And everyone today in most developing nations understands that internet is a great leveler. If you understand technology, if you have technology, you can leapfrog. However, if you do not have the technology or you cannot use it, um, you are going to be left behind further. The digital divide or the technology divide is going to increase. And that is why most governments want to connect people. Um, and obviously whether the strategies are right, wrong, that's a different thing. Now, what we've been doing for the last 12 years is in when we started, we found that in India, the public internet access points, the cyber cafes or kiosks were the point where people went for internet access primarily because you could pay for the amount you use. It was easier for people who did not have device. It was there for people who need assisted internet service, for example, to book a rail ticket or to get a certificate, et cetera. Many of them did not know how to do it. So these were the points we supported them. We also had, um, we tried to bring in more services into these points. There were more than um, 160,000 such points in India at that point of time where more than 40% internet access was happening. So we tried to get in more uh, internet related services there so that their business improves and they can also cater to people in who are walking into their uh, access points. Similarly, training users in uh, digital literacy so that they know how to use it in six Indian languages so that they can use it learn it in their own languages was something which we promoted. We trained about 60,000 old uh, you know, women and children, especially because that is something which we are passionate about that we want to bring the social equity also into the frame. Similarly, building capacity that, okay, now you're using the internet. How can you use it safely? How can you keep yourself secure? That is important. And that's what we have been focusing on because if, it's just not, in, you know, bringing the pipe uh, and getting the connectivity is one thing, but you need to ensure people can use it in a safe, trusted, accountable manner so that they can get a meaningful connectivity. And that's very important. And so that's something which we have been working on at the ground itself, uh, taking feedbacks, um, you know, helping people to understand how they can use the internet in a more meaningful and trusted manner. And also working with the regulators in terms of what should be the way out. For example, many times certain tech, uh, you know, programs of connecting people are made, but uh, you know, many times what we have found is, um, you know, the, the focus is on one technology, whereas, um, you know, what would I say? There are many other ways in which people can be connected. For example, you know, there are community networks where you get uh, people from the community to set up a network, run it and sustain it. Um, you know, perhaps uh, policies have to be made that various different technologies can be managed, can be used in different ways. Uh, so participation in policy making processes or when policies are framed is important. And that is also something which we focus on. Uh, like trying to get youth, trying to get people involved in these di dialogues, helping to them to understand what these policy implications are or what, what could happen and also making them make submissions of what they want. Because if, for example, a policy is made and those people are not in the table, um, a policy may not be so nuanced. Similarly, if there are companies who are coming up with uh, certain innovative technologies, supporting them is important. Um, many times we have found that there are various NGOs or civil society organizations who have done some innovative work of, in the community in trying to you know, uh, make people connected or come online. 
how can you make them more sustained or how can you help them collaborate with others is important. So the words which were used earlier by the other speakers in different contexts, such as collaboration, cooperation uh, is very important. Uh, for example, something which has worked, say for example, in a country, if those kind of technologies or solutions or, uh, can, or best practices can be shared across different communities, that's important, that helps. Um, similarly, the lessons which are learned in one place, if that is, can be shared. So, you know, the, building those bridges with people who have actually done things well or succeeded is important. Um, and of course, what we have learned is what has worked somewhere may not work somewhere else. Uh, so you possibly may have to customize it to the requirements of the people out there, um, which would actually work. You cannot always copy paste solutions. It has to be customized and you have to work with people, understand what their requirements are and then provide them solutions. Um, it should not be uh, that I find some solution good and I you know, just push it to people. Uh, I don't think adoption happens that way as in those are certain learnings. Absolutely. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned dialogue and community responsiveness and making sure that, that you're listening to the community that you're serving. I'm wondering how you have integrated feedback loops to collect that data, the, that information from the community and how to implement that in iterative process to make sure that you're always being responsive and you're catching those things that might not translate well from one community to another. So the, the most important thing is to have a communication channel which is open, which is flexible, where people can give you the feedback. Um, you know, in a non, you know, if you have a non-judgmental feedback mechanism, people are much more um, open to giving you feedback. Similarly, many times, uh, for example, if it's a policy process in which we want community feedbacks, for example. Um, many people may not be able to articulate it, uh, you know, what their exact issues are. But if you can, you know, take it in their language, the way they are saying after a lot of discussions, and you can translate it into the language which say regulators or policymakers understand and share, perhaps, you, uh, you know, those bridges can be made. Um, you know, because sometimes not everyone can express it in that way or can uh, articulate things in that way. But overall, even in developing countries and even in rural uh, communities, what we have found is people want to adopt new technologies and use it. They are open to it. Only thing is um, it has to be made available to them. Uh, the trust in the technology has to be there. For example, uh, you know, when nations are leapfrogging and bringing in new technology, which is very good and which is needed, is the data protection, is the privacy of the individuals protected? Do you have the regulations to ensure, you know, the rights of people are um, protected? Those are important. Uh, those, uh, if the checks and balances are in place, I don't think, uh, you know, um, you know, technology can be a phenomenal use. For example, uh, today, um, you know, when there was a lockdown, when schools were closed everywhere, people had to rely on, a mo you know, in rural areas, in on a mobile or something for, uh, you know, studies. Um, many students dropped off because their parents could not afford to a smartphone for that matter, or the internet connectivity was not great. It was not a 4G, even a 4G or a 3G in certain places. Um, so how do you give, um, you know, you ensure that people have um, the connectivity which they need, uh, you know, so those things are important. And if people can give those feedbacks, it helps. How do you ensure that there are no shutdowns? Uh, for example, in India, we've had a lot of internet shutdowns and that disrupts people's lives um, you know, education, business, etc. How do you ensure that policies are there that, you know, ensures there is connectivity at all times? It is not broken so that the benefits which you and I are enjoying can be enjoyed by other people. So there are, um, you know, opportunities 
there are issues, but I think as com communities, if everyone can work together, um, being in the same table to address those issues, I think um, the benefits of technology can be better uh, availed by everyone equitably across the globe. Thank you so much. Uh, I think the perspective that you've brought uh, as it relates to the developing world and some challenges that you continue to, to face and, and opportunities that you see on the horizon uh, are deeply informative for the work that's happening all around the world uh, and tremendously grateful for your willingness to come and to share today. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to uh, mention? Not really. I think um, the you know the the people need to be connected. Uh, they need to enjoy the benefits which we have, and I think it's a it's an entire community effort to make that happen. It's not going to happen in a day, but even if we take steps, um, even if we make wrong steps and we correct it, I think we should get somewhere at least to um, ha lessen the digital divide or the gender digital divide, as you call yeah. it. Thank you. And personally, I'm tremendously grateful that you draw the intersection there between uh, gender equity and digital equity, because we know that people are disproportionately impacted based on several demographic variables, and that is certainly one of them. Uh, so thank you uh, so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And last but absolutely not least, it is my uh, pleasure to invite uh, Philip Thingo to join me. Uh, Philip, as we shared, is one of the directors for ASU's Thunderbird uh, School of Management. Uh, Philip, hi, <laughs> so nice to see you today. Uh, I think we have this incredible opportunity. Um, and Rita was so generous uh, in her uh, conversation of what's happening uh, in India and some of the challenges that are facing uh, the work that she does uh, on, on large scale uh, and at a deeply community uh, level. Uh, to address the, the, the chasm that is now digital equity and, and ensuring that people who need it most are really connected for the right reasons, that they, they need connection to, to fully engage uh, in life and to have equal opportunity. Uh, I know that the work that you're doing uh, is, is primarily centered in Africa. Uh, and so if we shift a little bit to speak uh, about the work that you're doing, certainly the, the roles that you have are at an incredibly high level. So you have insights. Uh, into some dialogues that the, the overwhelming majority of us just do not. Uh, so from your perspective, if you, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to bring it all home for us a little bit today, no pressure. Um, but, but really thinking of it um, as, you know, at the highest level of policy, what do we need to be aware of and what are you seeing? Um, but, but also, uh, from a deeply human uh, and connection standpoint, uh, how can we work from a human and interpersonal uh, perspective to engage with one another to make sure that we really understand what's happening and tie that to smart regions and to the fourth industrial revolution? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to throw it all in there in one oh, big Oh, God. I, I, I think, and, and thank you so much, really. And, and I was intensive, intently listening to President Crow. Um, and, and, and something that I think uh, the, the, the charter of ASU, uh, that the, a school that, that has actually taken up a social mission. And, and, and I think for me, that's really at the core of this discussion is to the extent that um, we must all work towards uh, ensuring that we, we do not um, work against the outcomes of inclusivity, but also that everybody has, has access to prosperity. Because I think for me, that's what I know, and Rita will agree with me, but also uh, my colleagues in Africa would agree is that um, continents like Asia and Africa have been, for the first, second, and third, third industrial revolution, been excluded. And, and, and that's actually my first point, that as much as we, this conversation is happening in, 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 um, amidst a burden of history of inequality, um, and that uh, the context has really been unequal. So as much as we're talking about inclusivity, we're talking about inclusivity, but then we are not all at the same level. Right. But we have an opportunity with technology innovation and for the resolution to, for people to leapfrog so that we can create an equitable future. So I'll not dwell on the past, but see the opportunity we have to create a more prosperous and equitable future. The second bit of course is, uh, which is really where I'm sitting at the policy level is that a lot of these things happen in silos. Um, and so again, and this also work, works against a lot of outcomes, right? So uh, you have people working on electricity, you have people working on data, but then, 
um, they are not all coordinated. And so, and that is why I, 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 I was so happy to hear the issue around collaboration. And so from where I sit at the policy level, and, and as you say, trying to bring it home, we've seen six key pillars uh, or what we think are the foundations for successful and inclusive and responsible uh, and responsive uh, technology inclusion. I see digital as the appliance, technology as the, as a kitchen, right? <laughs> um, so data is one of them. So data is a fundamental foundation. Uh, whether they're talking about artificial intelligence, whether they're talking about machine learning, if we do not improve our data systems, and that includes, whether it's from, it's from the work that is being done in the village, and we know that's where data gaps are a lot, to the national level where a lot of these things have to, abrogate, to be aggregated in a way that then they make sense around policy and decision making. So data is key. And I know issues have been raised by Amrita around privacy, security. So how do we create a robust data ecosystem? But also in a way that we can share data. And you mentioned inter human inter I, yes, systems interoperability, but I almost want to talk about human interoperability where private citizens, civil society, academia are sharing data in a way that can then deliver, deliver equitable development outcomes. The second one, of course, is, is the topic of today, which is the internet, uh, ensuring that we have affordable, accessible, available internet that is undisrupted. And, 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 and because President Crow mentioned this, that you really lived in a technology. In continents like Africa, it is a matter of life choices because a technology now is about saving lives and saving livelihoods. So a lot of my, my fellow citizens in Africa have to make a choice, whether they have to connect or miss a meal, whether they have to, whether they have to connect or take transport to work because the incomes are not growing yet connectivity is everything. So we should think through how we ensure that the internet does not become that type of, that type of a choice, that I have to give up something in order to connect. So I think internet and affordability and accessibility is important. The third one, of course, is skills. Because the world is changing very quickly, how do we ensure that we are skilling and skilling up skilling at the same level? And it's about fluency. It's not about being techies or geeks. It's simply people being able to understand how to connect and so and they can leverage the opportunities of the internet. Because if you're not a LinkedIn, you will not get a job, right? If, if you cannot telecommute, then you will not be able to work. So, but you need those basic skills of, of access. We can ensure that everybody has access, but do they have the skills to engage equitably? Uh, because you know um, opportunities, unfortunately, flow disproportionately to early adopters and not to everybody else. So, so that's what we're seeing. We need to we need to mediate that. The fourth one is the energy. Uh, we have to power uh, the internet. Uh, in continents like Africa, only 22% uh, of Africa is connected to the internet, and that's about 1.7 billion people. But then only a third of the continent has electricity. So again, how do you ensure that you also ensure that we can get clean, green, affordable energy that powers the internet? The fifth piece, of course, is governance. And we're thinking about agile governance, right? So how do you, and I've, I've had people talking about policy making, and that's where I obsess, because leadership is everything. So how do you ensure that we develop laws and policies and regulations that do not stifle innovation or do not challenge the, the, the previous four, whether it's data, internet skills, and energy? Uh, but also that's where your feedback loops comes in, in terms of responsiveness, because agility in governance means you have to do governing a little bit differently. The final bit is sustainable financing. We have to pay for it. And it's changing very quickly, right? So, so how do you ensure that even our, our, our business models around resourcing is, is, is quite important uh, around how we fund uh, technology innovation, but also access to technology. So if you ask me, those will be the six foundations. <laughs> uh, and, and, and if we can do that, then I think we'll probably be on a, on a, on a good path. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh, it, it leads me to think back of, of the checks and balances that you mentioned, right? So uh, checks and balances are so key in every single one of those uh, key points that you mentioned, particularly when we're talking about data and data sovereignty uh, and simultaneously creating agency uh, and ensuring that, that all of the things and, and funding and, and policy, um, those are different checks and balances that have to exist in each one of those arenas. So how do you reconcile making sure that the people who are doing that, those, that checking and balancing 
um, that they are communicating in a feedback loop process as well. So that, so that all of this is as deeply interconnected as it can be, and it doesn't continue to exist in those silos or in disparate uh, arenas. So, I mean, of course, in our case, and I'll really speak to Africa, of, of, of the two pathways I'm working on right now, and, and you've seen in my many hats, this is the challenge that you see, kind of drag you, <laughs> drag you into these spaces, is, is I think the, the first bit really is about literacy. And, and I realize that, and this is interesting, because uh, of course, technology innovation is driven by private sector. And, and we forget that the laws and regulations are done by public sector. So the, there's an issue of, of literacy and fluency around these changes and how technology is moving, so that even when public sector is making policies, that the policies are, 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 are responsive. And, and we've seen that is a huge gap. And so right. we are really obsessed in terms of how do you improve fluency of, of policymakers around understanding this new age of technology innovation uh, and, and the, and the ubiqu ubiquitous nature of it. So that's, that's one pathway you've seen. The second pathway and I've had in the conversation is use cases. Uh, because people want, people are risk averse, right? <laughs> so we want to see where things are working and so then learn from that and see, it may not be the copy paste as Amrita just warned, it's about the process. So how was it done? the sandbox methodology. And I think we have a lot of them. And I think that's where universities like ASU are important because this is where trust comes in. You need somebody who can be trusted, who, who, who is not seen as having <laughs> biases that can then mediate that process in a way that then everybody feels they were included in delivering that outcome. And so for us, those are the two things we're obsessed with. And, and in the African continent, that's what we're working on to the extent that how do you create these new innovative spaces where you, you can evolve? Uh, because checks and balances ultimately is about trust. Uh, because if you think about it, power, power has changed. <laughs> the, the, how we understood power right now uh, is continu continuously evolving, but then it means we kind of have to evolve this new, whether there's a new business model, whether there's a new financial model, whether there's a new city regulation, whether, whether it's even a new form of engagement, because what you're asking for is can we engage differently? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that sort of embraces civic participation, embraces social inclusion, uh, you know, is, is open, uh, and I'm seeing on the chat people talking about open data platform, open platforms, but this is new and, and it cannot be taught. It has to be mediated and, and people have to be part of it so that they can believe that it works. So that's the two part of this. I think you just uh, very eloquently brought home uh, so many of the concepts that, that have been uh, surfaced during our dialogue today. Uh, clearly, we have to lean in heavily to collaboration and cooperation. Clearly, that needs to be driven by multi-sector, multi-stakeholder dialogues that are deep and meaningful and, and built on listening to one another to really address in a community responsive way the challenges that we're seeing. Um, and I think trust uh, has just the throughput that, that is running through all of it. And if we can't get to that goal, then we will continue to have some challenges. Uh, Philip, I, I really appreciate <laughs> you joining us. I appreciate you bringing it home, which you absolutely did. I would love to invite the rest of the panel, uh, Angela, Nicole, uh, Wendy, uh, and Rita to please join one more time. Uh, and I would love, and Philip, please stay. Uh, and I'd just like to ask everyone just one final question. You know, as we, as we think about what is on the horizon, as we think about those things that we really hope to accomplish in the near term. And assuming we have built trust <laughs> and assuming that we are cooperating and doing so well, um, what do you see in the near term? What, what can we really get to uh, in the near term if we're able to do these things together? Um, and, and anyone feel to jump, jump in first? I, th I think we get more clear planning so we, we get a clarity on how the different um, entities, community anchor institutions, businesses, others are, how they can work together um, so that as this federal, more federal money becomes available, we do a better job with that federal money. So if we don't have clarity on how we're working together, there can be a, um, maybe we don't use the money in the best possible way and we all want the greatest impact we can possibly get. So I think it's that clarity of the partnerships. Absolutely. Wendy, I would love to ask you your perspective on this. 
Can you repeat the question one more time, please? Sure. So, so assuming that that uh, all the things that we discussed today have happened, that we have trust, we have uh, deep collaboration from all of the people who need to be engaged and we're talking to one another. What is the hope in the near term that we can get to? Understanding there's, there, there is money coming and there are expectations that we address this challenge. What do you hope that we can achieve soon? I think we can definitely achieve like our goal. All of our goal is equity to have digital equity. And I think since we're all in the same like room with like-minded individuals that we can now network with and collaborate with, that can definitely be possible because the more people that are engaged in this, the more um, powerful we become and getting our goals completed. So I believe just the networking part of it is gonna be amazing. And it gives me a lot of hope for the future. Well said. Who's next? Um, so I would say that if uh, the blocks are in place, we are in the right track. Um, we could possibly be on the road to achieve what we want to achieve in terms of having equitable, uh, you know, technology as, uh, you know, everyone getting the same kind of technology benefits, which we all want to improve all our lives. I would say I I'm an optimist and I look at it in that manner. And definitely, uh, you know, the old adage, unity is strength. So if you have each other to hold each other and pull ourselves up, I think we would be in the right track. Absolutely. And yay, optimism. Absolutely. <laughs> if we don't have that, I think we're in some trouble. So thank you so much for, for, for highlighting that. Philip or Nicole? Well, I'll go. Um, I, I, I think this is a new stretch for everybody. If, if, if you all haven't realized this, we are in this together. I mean, we really have no choice um, but to work together. And if the pandemic has told us anything, is that we are all interconnected. And so it, it's just, uh, it makes big business sense for private sector. It makes big developmental sense for government, for, for governments. It, it makes big um, academic, but also research sense for, for academia to be able to ensure that their research actually is of public value as, as, as ASU basically puts it. And for citizens, it's, it's, it works for them because then we can all be, uh, we can all know that their voices are heard and they're part of, of this new form of governance we're trying to actually. Uh, and so if we have a team that, that, that is already deliberately, and, and we have to have a deliberateness trying to do this together, then I think the future can only be bright. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Nicole, the last word is yours. You know, we've seen some incredible partnerships come out of, you know, the past two years, and we really have a lot to uh, be optimistic about in terms of infrastructure development and, you know, all of these initiatives. But what really gives me hope and what I'm excited to see in the future is to see the, the role of public libraries continue to be elevated in all of these spaces and really to think about uh, encouraging the youth to join the information profession and to be more librarians. So we absolutely need more indigenous librarians. We need more indigenous uh, and uh, people of color serving in library leadership roles as well to continue to be these change makers in their local communities. So I'm excited for a world where we see all of, you know, all of us being here and all of us um, able to, to lead these conversations and to continue to support each other. Absolutely, thank you so much for, for that comment in particular. And I could not agree more, uh, the role of the youth in helping us to achieve these goals and engaging and empowering them to be the voices of the future. Uh, to, to address the things that we are all collectively hoping to address. Um, they, they, they are the future. Um, so thank you to everyone who joined us today. This has been a fabulous panel. Uh, thank you again, Amrita Chowdhury of CCAIO, Angela Seifer of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, Philip Thingo from ASU's Thunderbird School of Management, Nicole Umayam from the Digital Inclusion Library Consultant, uh, and of course, ASU's student, Wendy Ruiz, uh, the insights that you shared with us today uh, were just absolutely fabulous. Uh, and I'm sure that everyone who, who had the opportunity to join uh, enjoyed it just as much as I do. So, so thank you again.